I'm Eugenie Tsai, the John and Barbara Vogelstein Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Brooklyn Museum. I organize the Kehende Wiley Show, and it is my pleasure to greet you here tonight for our very special program with not just one, but two extremely brilliant artists for this evening's program. Um, DJ Spooky, The Subliminal Kid, That Subliminal Kid, and Kehende Wiley. They're also long-term friends, which makes this uh, really special. I'm first gonna introduce DJ Spooky. He is, um, he once said that music and art are always in dialogue, and so I suspect that we'll see some of that tonight. A musician, artist, and writer, DJ Spooky grew up in Washington, D.C. He wrote his undergraduate thesis at Bowdoin College on the 19th century German composer Richard Wagner and his concept of what's called the Gesamtkunstwerk. Translated from German, this term means a total work of art which synthesizes poetry, visual art, music, and performance. And I think this topic reveals DJ Spooky's early fascination with forms of art that defy categorization. His performance, uh, and so I'm, since I have no idea what he's, oh, I do know what he's gonna do tonight. He is doing acoustic portraits of Kehende's paintings. And I suspect that we'll see some of the, uh, some synthesis of many different categories. Back from Milan Design Week, where he launched his book, The Imaginary App and his own iPad app has had over 14 million downloads. Uh, I believe, and he can correct me, that he is the editor of this magazine, Origin, the Conscious Culture magazine on one side, and the Conscious Lifestyle magazine on the other side. Um, just again, showing what a multi-talented person um, he is. So please welcome DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid, First and foremost, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here in, uh, you know, in the Republic of Brooklyn. You know, <laughs> um, and for me, I, I live in Tribeca, and it's always one of those things where uh, it's funny living in Tribeca. Kehinde is a couple blocks over. Uh, Richard Serra is my next door neighbor. It's very rare you have a, a famous DJ and a famous sculptor living next door, and always he never smiles. Just remember that one. Um, and people like uh, who else? Uh, Peter Howley lives in the neighborhood, and so on. So when I come to Brooklyn, we hit the reset button. It's one of those things where I love the, the energy, and I think it, Brooklyn's in the middle of a huge renaissance right now. So by way of that renaissance, I want to begin tonight's discussion, first and foremost, by thanking Eugenie for such a wonderful introduction. But I want to riff on Kehinde's paintings from the viewpoint of how people look at collage in the 21st century. So as we jump into this, the first step I'm thinking about is, this is um, Michael Ray Charles. He's a very renowned painter, but amusing enough, him and Kara Walker have a little bit more of a resonance with one another, and Kehinde comes from a different school. You're going to be seeing tonight a little bit of a kind of a remix of thinking about perception, and that's what Kehinde is, I think, doing. If you think about his portraits of Franz Fanon, if you think about the idea of how people have repurposed and sort of reconsidered the role of representing African American male, there's other painters like Barclay Hendricks on one hand, or even one could argue people like Shep Ferry on the other, who have come up with uh, lots of different themes that I trace back to some of the DNA of the Harlem Renaissance. So Aaron Douglas was an African-American painter in the 1920s, and one of the beautiful things about this painting is you can see there's these sort of layers of circularity and layers and layers of kind of how the, the people are put in both silhouette and foregrounded. So paradoxically speaking, as a composer, that really, really intrigued me. Now, that brings me to this. Um, and in the last several years, we've noticed more and more that first-person narrative, uh, for example, the recent murder of another African-American male, uh, I just want to say Black Lives Matter tonight, so just thank you. Um,
So these are very fragile times, and the thread holding society together can always be ruptured at unexpected moments. And um, we've, what we've noticed is the role of digital media in portraying those incidents. So, uh, for example, the testimony of a cell phone that was carried by someone that portrayed in real time and in with reality and realism the murder of someone, or that matter being put on YouTube. Um, these are all things that somehow trace back to this idea of realness and representation and mobile media. So that leads me to what is the role of the composer in this paradoxical time. Um, I just want to show you a quick thing, really, just give you a little bit of context. The material you're going to be hearing tonight, um, first and foremost, I took a studio to Antarctica, and that's me hanging out on some of the ice fields near the Weddell Icy Shelf and also the Antarctic Peninsula. And I was doing photography, and this show eventually went to some of the places like the Metropolitan Museum and the Tate Modern. And I was really interested in the devastation of the landscape. So when you think about that in data, this is the data that you just, the photographs you were just seeing are based on, um, it's all temperature differentials that have been put into algorithms, and algorithms that have been translated into tones, tones that have been made into what you call algorithmic musical transcription. So it's about pattern recognition. And that's what Kehinde's work is about as well. If you think about pattern recognition as the foundation of 21st century life, one could argue his paintings, if you look, think about the Baroque and Neo-Baroque and Renaissance patterns that the African-American males are foregrounded against, that's something that is now the kind of DNA of our modern pop culture. So if you think about uh, one of the other forerunners here, uh, this is Burt Williams. He's a pretty intriguing character. He's considered to be America's first pop culture figure. He was a black guy in blackface pretending to be a white guy in blackface. All right, you know, uh, he'll soon have a retrospective at MoMA, I'm sure, right? Um, and the pun here is that this was wildly popular. It was called The Minstrel Show. And intriguingly enough, if you think about appropriation and role playing, African Americans have been appropriated by everything from Beck, the Beastie Boys, Elvis, uh, even Bush's swagger after he started bombing Iraq was a little bit of, you know. Uh, you know, there, it's one of those moments where you have to think about the vernacular of body language. And that's where Kehinde's work, I think, is one of the more powerful statements of this remix culture that we all call home. So what I'm going to do tonight is start with a couple of different compositions that reference not only his fascination with, this is Franz Fanon, whose who's seminal work, um, Black Skin, White Masks, um, is what set the tone for how we think about post-colonial aesthetics. But you can also think about the deep structural kind of tension, the dialectical process that goes on his, in his paintings. And think about hip hop, techno, dubstep, all these musics that come out of the urban context of thinking about collage as the basic DNA of our time. So uh, what you were hearing when you walked in was a riff from one of my favorite singers. I'm going to just play that for a second. And what you're going to be hearing tonight is another riff taken from my iPad app. Um, I developed this as a tool that we made for free, and we've had over 14 million downloads. And what it does is it makes loops. I'll just show you really quick. So basically all the normal gear you would see on a turntable is gone. And I can easily show you what that would look like from the viewpoint of a show. And then we'll jump into things. So for example, Normally when I'm DJing, here's me in Australia a couple days ago, we had a couple thousand people rocking out, and all these Australian girls were throwing their bras on stage. Uh, I think tonight's a little more sedate, right? Um, but look, see, they're all yelling, hey. So, so when I DJ, you know, it's not a background DJ kind of vibe. It's much more like full-on spectacle, people jumping. Tonight is the art mix. Um, so I really, you know, I've actually done one of the first events, if you remember correctly, here at the Brooklyn Museum out in the parking lot, and they got so big, I think, they have, are you guys still doing that? Okay, so there you go, right. <laughs> but um, with that said and done, I'm being joined tonight by a wonderful violinist from Tokyo, Tomoko. And we're going to um, do a riff on uh, several of the tracks that I've done as portraits of Kehinde's work. And what I want to do really quickly is give a bit of context. There is a gentleman by the name of Kalkidan, who's not as well known here in the US as one would imagine, but he's pretty intriguing in his own right uh, from the viewpoint of he raps in Hebrew. 
and we had this at the uh, Brooklyn, I'm sorry, at the, the Jewish Museum, and it was a pretty amazing situation to see how African and Afro diaspora folks could rap in all these different languages. So do you want to play the motif for a second? And then we'll jump into it.
right. So that's a very beautiful piece, and the motifs and elements are all derived from looking at the imagery that Kehinde has used as the backdrop. So when you look at his paintings, first and foremost, you have to remember, Photoshop is now the painter's new palette. And I love that. I think it's an amazing and fun thing. For example, this is my remix of Bush and Obama. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just sort of line up the cheekbones, you know. Um, so you have to remember that when a painter is looking at something, the studio is where they are based. But now with digital media, the studio has now become very abstract. So Kehinde's work is moving between studios in China, West Africa, Cuba, you name it. So there's a globalization at work. And that's become implicit in, I think, his production process. So too with DJing. So we are both artists of collage and sampling. And what you're going to be hearing next is called Musa. And for me, intriguing enough, if you go back to the beginning of African-American hip-hop scene, uh, Iceberg Slim was one of the first people to really think about the poetry of this stuff. Um, now, black people, we love ice. You know, you got Ice Cube, Ice T. You know, if, you got, if you got vanilla ice, you know, the white guy, you know, hey, everybody. So the fun here is that ice and this notion of bling, uh, sort of conspicuous consumption, um, it goes back to his stuff and thinking about, you know, the, the idea of the, the African-American male as being put in a context of power and the coolness of it all. So that's where the ice is. So um, this next piece is called Musa, and I'm really intrigued by uh, the way Kehinde has been able to kind of flip um, these issues around representation. So um, what you're seeing, let me just show you guys really quick what I'm doing to give you a little bit of background. So say, for example, if I want to call up James Brown, who's another big inspiration for tonight. Um, James! James Brown! One, two, three, uh! pretty addictive. All right, so what I'm doing is looping and layering. And so the whole idea is in the same way that Kehinde would have these loops and motifs on the work, you can think of a hip hop beat, a, t a dubstep beat, a techno beat as playing with quantized rhythms. You're basically, if you think about visualizing it, it's different kinds of geometry at work. So um, basically this is kind of like the art set. I could be rocking wild parties, but tonight, you know, we're going to sit down, relax, and think about Kehinde's paintings. So Tomoko, you ready? All right, Musa.
So um, this next piece is Tree of Life, and it's also combined with another piece called Caffeine. And by the way, everything we're playing tonight is available on iTunes as a kind of a free elements of download, so to speak. So if you're interested and want to remix Kehinde, feel free. Uh, we're calling that project The Wind Up. Let's see. It's all about um, keeping elements and bits and pieces ready. So uh, when you go on iTunes, you just flip it, and you can grab that and then pull it straight into the app and you're good to go. So um, this last piece is going to be strings first. It's the tree of life. And that's based on when I was having conversations between Kehinde and the hip hop MC Kalkadon, who uh, is a, what you call Beta Israel, which is black uh, Jews who essentially were taken out of Ethiopia. And he did a series of portraits of that, some of which are in this exhibition here. Um, so Tree of Life is going to segue. It's actually, you have to imagine it with beats or without. So I'm going to do the first one with no, just strings, and I'll be sampling and looping the strings, and then the second one with beats, just to give you guys a little bit of sense of a remix. You ready? All right, so strings first.
So Tomoko is amazing, and it's been a real pleasure. So just want to <laughs> thank. So this last piece is called "Of Water and Ice," and I want to just make sure that everyone realizes that there's a lot of conceptual layers going on with the music that you're hearing. Um, so um, basically, uh, recently I was in the Guangzhou Biennale, and it was curated by Ai Weiwei. And, um, and amusingly enough, when I was doing the research for it, we had it where um, Ai Weiwei had asked me to do some music for another project of his, but then he got put in jail. So he was he's under house arrest, and uh, he didn't show up for the opening, needless to say. Uh, but it was kind of a fun situation because it was kind of this ghost city, and it was called Ordos. And so he had heard of a couple projects. One of them, I did a piece where we remixed the Acropolis, and uh, you know, it's in New York, right? That's how we do it. Um, so uh, the Greek government I asked me to do a piece, and we had it at the Acropolis, and we had about 5,000 people come out to the show. I'm like, hey, everybody, thanks for coming to the show. I'm the first DJ to play here in like 3,000 years. And, um, you know, so the interesting thing about that, it was one of my favorite science fiction writers, uh, William Gibson, has a phrase where he says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So um, when the Greeks were asking me what we wanted to do, I said, well, there's this piece called Birth of a Nation from 1915. And so we called it Rebirth of a Nation, and we projected it throughout the ruins, and we had cranes and all sorts of stuff going on. So when Ai Weiwei had heard about that, uh, he was like, Paul, let's try and figure out one of your Antarctica projects for that. And uh, what eventually became um, a situation where we had bits and pieces of that play um, as a string ensemble, and I have, uh, had Kronos Quartet play the soundtrack for that. So one of them, we, we had a string ensemble playing live in Korea, um, and I was sampling them here in New York. So it was kind of using the internet, looking at Namjoon Pike and stuff like that. But uh, for Ai Weiwei, what we wanted to do was figure out a clever way to update that for the Guangzhou Biennale. And what eventually ended up happening was a similar thing that what I ended up doing at the Met, uh, which was looking at just geography and climate change. So this last piece is called Of Water and Ice. And now Antarctica is the only place on Earth with no government. Thank God you don't have to pay taxes there, right? Um, but the whole thing is that Antarctica is one of those spots that essentially, this is me just sort of sitting on these huge glacier fields, and, um, you know, this is the Iceberg Slim update, you know, so. Um, trying to figure out, hitting the reset button on what is it a composer does with portraits. So Kahende's portraits are figurative, uh, mine are data. And the idea was looking at data itself as a new palette. So what you're going to be seeing and hearing in a moment is taking bits and pieces of uh, these um, equations written by this gentleman, Johannes Kepler, and in 1611, he was on his way home, and a snowflake landed on his sleeve, and he ended up writing this piece called Six Sides of a Snowflake, which is considered to be one of the first prototypes for writing about mathematics and nature. So if you see Kehinde's work, you'll look at closely, and there's a lot of patterns in the background. And you, one could argue um, whether it be what happened with the Moors in Spain or with the geometry of Islam, for example, that if, if effectively changed the face of painting in Europe because of geometry and so on, Baroque and so on. But when you think about science and nature, they're just mirrors of one another. So what you're going to be hearing is that essay, uh, Six Sides of a Snowflake. Looking here, you can see it's a hexagonal form. And whenever you see a piece of ice, it's essentially just permutations of a hexagon over and over and over until you get to Iceberg Slim. There we go. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to figure out was taking that, that experience and applying it to composition. So this is the last piece. Uh, is the vocal clips are loops taken from a singer that I had sing the geometry that you're just seeing, and then the beats and so on were made out of the sound of ice. Um, and it's an open source project. Again, Antarctica is the only place with no government, so there's no copyright law, uh, and nobody owns the ice. So um, you want to just play the first motif, and then we'll go in. There we go. Thank you. 
So, Tomoko. So with that said and done, I have the pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Eugenie, who's then going to introduce Kehinde. And like I said, everything you're hearing tonight is freely available online. Um, and uh, it's on iTunes and on the websites. And Kehinde is not freely available, by the way. So uh, <laughs> I think his paintings are going for a couple hundred thousand, millions, something like that. But uh, not free. All right. So G Eugenie, there you go. Thanks. I'd like to thank DJ Spooky and Tomoko for that truly sublime performance. <laughs> and next, we're going to hear from Kehinde Wiley, whose spectacular exhibition, A New Republic, can be seen here on the fifth floor. So if you haven't yet seen it, you should run right up after the program and check it out. Uh, Wiley was born and raised in Los Angeles. He received his BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute before traveling east to take up graduate studies at Yale University. After receiving his MFA in 2001, he went on to a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem, and shortly after had his very first museum exhibition here at the Brooklyn Museum. We're extremely proud to be presenting his second exhibition here, as I mentioned, Kehinde Wiley, A New Republic, which is a spectacular overview of this artist's impressive 14-year career. It's here through May 24th, so if you don't make it tonight, be sure to come back and don't miss it. Wiley was recently awarded a Medal of Arts by the U.S. Department of State for his outstanding commitment and contributions to the Art in the Embassies Program, an international cultural exchange. Many of you have probably seen his paintings on Empire, Fox 5's wildly successful um, <laughs> series. Uh, and I have to say I was proud and thrilled last night when our, the First Lady of New York, Shirlane McRae, came to see Kehinde's show and he took her through. I wanted to be a fly on the wall to hear that conversation. Kehinde works in Brooklyn, though like DJ Spooky, he has a global presence with studios and projects in different parts of the world. So please join me in welcoming Kehinde Wiley. First off, I want to say thank you all for coming out tonight, and I uh, just want to give another hand to Paul D. Miller, DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid, for rocking the house tonight. Paul has been a very dear friend of mine for many years, and we've always had this insane conversation about stuff. There it is. Hair. Uh, it was my starting point. <laughs> this was uh, stuff back at Yale. Uh, started doing some crazy stuff, thinking about Samson, biblical notions of hair and power, fusing that with Fragonard, that sense of acerbic uh, uh, color sensibility, the feminine, the masculine. How does color become gendered? How does color function in a society? How does hair function to serve a social purpose? In many ways, I wanted to take color here uh, Seafoam Green. This is from Martha Stewart's 1999 home collection. Uh, <laughs> using color as a way of being social. Like, how do we look at color? Uh, we look at it in the same ways that we look at people, people that we see in different ways. This is a piece of paper that I found in the streets in Harlem. Uh, it, was just, it was just blowing through the streets. It fell out of someone's car, cop car probably. 
made a series of portraits thinking about mug shots as a means of having no way of positioning the body. How does one choose to position their body in a portrait? So all of these choices, so many of these people in a, a lot of these paintings that I've referenced have been spending their entire lives getting ready for these moments. My life uh, in South Central Los Angeles growing up was uh, starting in a very completely different narrative. You know, wondering how people position themselves has a lot to do with what they have access to. I, I go out in the streets and I find individuals who are minding their own business, trying to get to the subway, and I just stop them. I say, I say listen, you want to be part of this. Show them examples of my work, try to convince them of what I do. Uh, most people say no. Uh, I think part of that is just, you know, it's a big city. Oftentimes it's in New York. Increasingly it's all over the place. It's now in, in Sri Lanka, it's in uh, Brazil, it's in uh, China. There's uh, a sense in which uh, dealing with people in public spaces, you have to get your game together. You have to be able to talk to people and say, in a convincing way that your work is about something serious, about merit. What am I doing? Who are these people? How did they arrive in the room? All of these people are uh, people who ostensibly saw something in it. What they're wearing is what they were wearing that day. What they're looking at are books on my shelf, art historical books. And I, you know, I say, basically, go through those art historical books and figure out what you like, figure out what resonates with you? How do you imagine seeing yourself? Traditionally, artists have all the power. They hold all the keys. They decide how the model is going to be positioned and so on. I decide to say to the sitters, you have a choice in how you are positioned in these pictures. A lot of guys choose swords. <laughs> That's not their doing. This is old power. This is Europe. This is uh, empire. On some level, I'm not talking about the TV show, I'm talking about, uh, <laughs> I'm talking about uh, early paintings, that sense of grace that people occupy in those paintings. As much as I criticize a lot of those early paintings, I am absolutely in love with the practice of Western European easel painting. I'm absolutely in love with it. You know, I started back when I was 11 years old. My mother took me to art school uh, to keep me out of the streets. I mean, South Central Los Angeles back in the 80s, not, not cute. Uh, going to art school daily and then going to these museums, looking at these images of people in full splendor with powdered wigs, wigs and, and, and lap dogs and, and pearls and, and, and all of this stuff that shows a sense of, what, arrival? I don't know. Uh, what my work does try to do is to, to look at what are the best parts of that narrative. This equestrian series comes from a body of work called Rumors of War, which was instituted after uh, the Second Gulf War. I really wanted to look at the ways in which war has been glorified art historically, looking at the sense in which artists have always been at the service of churches and states, but at its absolute come shot moment, war is in there. And equestrian stuff is, is, is where it really reaches its high pitch moment. You can see that ego tripping, chest beating, is the, uh, the, uh, the language uh, of the day. But also, you can also see in, in many ways a kind of ridiculousness that surrounds all of that chest beating. In many ways, what undergirds these uh, obvious shows of ego and, and, and desires for shows of self-import is a type of uh, pathos a type of sadness. My truest belief is that at its best, what art can do is communicate aspects of uh, the permanent. But what I think really rounds that is the sense in which all of this work will outlive all of us. There's a, an indelible sadness that surrounds any plastic image that pictures painfully young, uh, hopeful people uh, trying to picture themselves, not only historically, but here in the streets of Harlem and Queens and Brooklyn. What I try to do on some level is to provide a sense of trace, a sense of evidence, a sense in which, sure, as you got dressed that morning, you thought you were 
going to be looking great for yourself, but you know, five uh, minutes into the conversation, you're invited to be in this photo shoot where then you're now hanging on one of the great museum walls. There is something to be said about chance. This really is about chance. These are people who, uh, unlike all of those old European paintings, had no idea what was coming. And so, in as much as this work is about celebrating great uh, painting technique and celebrating uh, the aesthetic uh, formula uh, so surrounding how to make something look great, it's also, I think, in many ways about uh, uh, how unlikely and how improbable and how wasteful this entire enterprise is. A lot of the people who came to my studio in Harlem years ago when I first got started wanted to know what was up with this obsession with portraiture. Why would anyone spend this much time, this much energy, this much effort uh, doing a portrait simply of someone they didn't know uh, and a history that wasn't in fact their own? My answer in, in, in some sense is that this is all a type of self-portraiture. What you're getting is glimpses at others, but uh, in some sense you're inching in closer and closer to who this queer, black, American uh, uh, painter happens to be, what his uh, sensibilities happens to be, what, it, what uh, he wants to see in the world. It's a type of advocacy. It's a visual and aesthetic uh, saying yes to something. Uh, what I'm simply saying yes to here is people who happen to look like me. And that's, you know, it sounds, it sounds uh, really simple in many ways, but I think as a kid growing up, going to these museums and seeing uh, paintings of scale and merit and provenance, there is an emptiness there. There's a sense in which you want to know where you fit. It's also uh, a really great exercise as, a, as an artist to look at this body language. That body language at, at one time was the height of masculinity. <laughs> decay is in there. And decay in terms of fashion, decay in terms of uh, aesthetic sensibilities is, is, I think, inherent in the way that we appreciate an art object, the sense in which we look at a Franz Halls or a Van Dyck and appreciate some of those insanely or, uh, ornamented collars. Um, those are things that I think uh, should be in the work. I hope at its best that my work from the late 90s feels like it's work from the late 90s. Um, I think that uh, in the sense in which people can respect uh, uh, dress and dress as a means of addressing the outside world, we have to pay attention really to detail, attention to small tags that happen to be on shoes, attention to the way that people adorn themselves, attention to the way that we celebrate in very small moments every day of who we are. Art historically, there's an importance here to have exact quotation. There's a desire on some level to make sure that there's a sense in which we know the original was somewhere out there, and we know that this is a break. We know that there's a rip in the fabric of our perception surrounding what is heroic. On the other end of the heroic, though, are those fallen figures. In this country, there has been a repetition of young black men in the streets falling, being seen not in those states of grace, but in states of repose, not chosen repose, but stricken down. This body of work called Down was about taking that, expanding it in scale, looking at the moment where the hero's not on a horse, the hero's not beating his chest standing erect, but rather seen fully horizontally and mining the history of art, whether it be of saints or of soldiers or of heads of state, allowing those images to be something that turns. Scale matters here. 
It's not just about a painting on this scale, but rather a painting that contends with you in physical space so that as you stand next to it, you yourself feel as though it occupies space in the room as well. It's as though this, the painting functions in a two-dimensional scale, but also the physical act of it infers a type of three-dimensionality. Three Down was a call to arms. It was a, a sense in which an artist can say, I'm curious about uh, art history, but I'm also very fed up with uh, a very real uh, contemporaneous reality. Painting shouldn't be preachy. I, I hate that kind of stuff. I hate painting that wags its finger, that, 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 that assumes that there's a lesson to be told. I don't think painting is redemptive. I don't think portraiture tells you anything about who's in that picture. Uh, I have a radical, empty, all the way down, cold, atheistic sensibility concerning art. <laughs> However, I have to believe that there's something going on here. I have to believe that I'm doing more than creating high-priced luxury goods for wealthy consumers. I have to believe that in the act of looking at black and brown people in America, and increasingly all over the world, that I'm charting something. I'm charting the existence or, or, or the trace of who we were in a time and being mindful of all of those people who came before of us, and, uh, wealthy Europeans and those grand paintings, for example, who simply wanted to be loved and worshiped in many ways. And you know, the art, art can uh, field twin desires. Art can rub up against conflicting ideas of what should be going on in a picture. I like being uncomfortable in art. I like pushing myself outside of what I think I know about things. And I think that's why I left America and started going all over the world and, and, and pushing myself into new territory. Michael Jackson saw one of my paintings at the Brooklyn Museum and commissioned this portrait here. He uh, commissioned it shortly before his death, and so was never ultimately able to see its completion. But it was really great to be able to talk about the history of Art Rubens, uh, uh, Titian, Tiepolo. Michael knew a lot about uh, art history, strangely. Uh, people probably wouldn't know that about him. Art and fame and his own fame was a really important thing to deal with. In that painting, you see that there's a lot of armor. We were thinking about armor as a means of protecting the body at the core, but it's also blinging out of control. It's about uh, uh, projecting a type of grace, but also a type of uh, core protecting. I think about fashion in that, in that way. I think about fame in that way. I think about them all as colors on my palette. And so there's an interesting uh, opportunity as an artist in the 21st century to be able to work with uh, celebrity as, as a means of communicating something about itself. What is the utility of it? What does it say about us? Um, there's also an ability in projects such as this where we were uh, celebrating uh, the first World Cup in, in South Africa and its history. The global scale and the global uh, stage uh, is something that uh, remains of interest to me. All of the paintings that you see here are inspired by the social realist propaganda posters of the Mao years in China. The promise was of a communal society where uh, if we all came together and cooperated, a new type of political organization was possible. When you look at young black men from the streets of Brooklyn here at the Fulton Mall, uh, it feels a little bit different. Um, what, what happens in these paintings is that uh, the same language and the decorative traditions of, of China are there. The framing techniques are all hand gilded to give you that lacquered sense of, of place and space, uh, space and place. 
But it's also, I think, um, a way of looking at China, but at America at the same time. And as much as these paintings are about those uh, propaganda posters, they're, they're also about those uncomfortable black men trying to smile. This is a video in which I asked those men who were in the paintings to smile for an hour. The smile decays into facial spasms, and it's just, <laughs> it's a difficult thing to keep up. This is a painting from Senegal. I did an exhibition in which I went all throughout West Africa looking at public sculpture. There's this amazing tradition of public sculpture in West Africa in which all of the, the sculpture is actually made of cast cement. There's no books out about it. So if there are any historians here, I implore you to do some sort of scholarship into this. All of those sculptures are decaying quickly. They're about uh, former colonial masters. They're about uh, uh, the political leaders. Uh, what happens when you go into small villages and uh, medium-sized towns all throughout West Africa and ask uh, young men to take on those poses? It's about again, uh, mining that history and allowing a type of slippage to occur between then and now. It's important me, for me, however, to keep a really tight uh, consumerist 18 to 35 demographic with regards to these paintings. Every person within these works references, in many ways, the type of consuming culture that the work itself is referencing. So, what is the work? It, it, it is a portrait, but it's also a signifier of something larger. It's, a, it's, it's, it's trying to point to the culture outside of itself. The work uh, also has a tendency to reference the history and the material history of framing. Paintings uh, are stages. Every painting has a way of announcing itself and a way of pronouncing whatever is within the frame is important. All of the frames that you see in this work are custom uh, created, oftentimes uh, hand hewn. Uh, in the case of the work from Senegal and from Nigeria, all of the works were uh, made from woods that were drawn directly from the forest there. But as you can see here, this is a painfully beautiful tradition of, of sculpture. The work then tries to echo uh, that work. All of the backgrounds are coming in this case, from the marketplaces. So I'll go every day to the marketplaces and collect voracious, voraciously the fabrics that are there. And so I ended up having this insane collection of African fabrics. I can just make these suits and stuff like this. Um, but then I start using those as these fields for the paintings. In the earlier works, you notice that if I'm using the late fr uh, French Rococo, there will then be late French Rococo filigree. If I'm uh, working uh, within the Baroque, then there will be Baroque uh, decorative components. In this work, there is a decided uh, uh, nod towards the local, um, but also the irrational. The backgrounds are fighting. They want to be the star of the show as well, and that's why they're sort of pushing up in the space. Art historically, if you look at 18th and 19th century portraiture, much of the work that you'll see are landed gentry who occupy the foreground, who stand in this sense of self-possession, looking back at their homes, their cattle, their wife, their kids, all possessions. And they occupy this sense of foreground rear. In my work, I wanted to destroy that. I wanted to break down that artificial binary. I wanted to create a sense in which the background itself is yearning to be just as present as those black and brown bodies that, ha that populate these paintings. This work that you're seeing now is coming out of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I went to the favelas uh, surrounding Rio. Uh, this one was uh, in Vidigal. And I wanted to go up there and, and to find models to to take on a photo shoot, but it was really tough because of the security situation. What ended up happening was actually uh, one of these young men's mothers invited us to, to set up in, in their home, and so uh, the entire photo shoot proceeded like that. 
there's something to be said about process on the road. You have to learn how to navigate uh, the road and n learn how to uh, improvise in many ways, but there's, there's, there's no fixed way of doing it. Uh, insofar as you think you know what's going on, the countries themselves will tell you where the work will be. In the case of Brazil, the decorative traditions from uh, Native American traditions as well as uh, Portuguese influences started to become part of the picture. The framing devices there were all based on marketplaces that uh, used small fragments and then uh, blew them out and exploded them. In India and Sri Lanka, I started to look at the history of uh, romanticism as it relates to the East in so much of the Orientalist art in, in Western Europe. Oftentimes you would see uh, European painters imagining what the white body would feel like in these more tropical and, and, and mysterious environments. Uh, oftentimes they would be talking about Asia Minor, they would be talking about then Morocco or Persia or uh, uh, Istanbul. This work expands that throughout the entire South Asian region and the Indian subcontinent to create this sort of ridiculous notion of the fantastical. Here I'm borrowing the backgrounds and the body language from the original paintings, but also allowing for uh, Hindu uh, body poses uh, to come into, into play, fusing a traditional uh, Indian sensibility and sculpture with a romantic sense of the exotic in Western European painting. This is Bonaparte in the Great Mosque of Cairo. Again, one of those paintings that nods towards Orientalism, but at the same time draws its influence from kids that were found in the streets of Mumbai. During that time, I was able to really get a sense in which uh, the, the material act of painting skin uh, it can vary so broadly. Um, as an artist, I grew up painting from the live model, so I ostensibly started off in the classic sense. Uh, generally, there were uh, white people as the models, and arguably, that's what I'm best at. That's how I learned how to paint. As a working artist going out into the world, I have to use art historical precedent as a means of moving forward. There's not much there. And so there's not much in the ways of learning how to paint beautiful black and brown flesh. There's uh, a really great technique that I've mastered over the years, which has to do with the underpainting. Tons of blues and greens, allowing the underpainting to be the body of the painting, and then a successive layer of thin sheets go in. It's, a, it's more of a technical thing. This is uh, the world stage Israel, where I went through Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, working with uh, Ethiopian Jews, working with Arab Israelis, Palestinians, going to basketball courts, going to nightclubs, going to uh, places where young people congregate and asking them to be, become part of this project. All of the backgrounds here are based on Israeli paper cuts, a tradition that exists all throughout the diaspora uh, from Eastern Europe on into Persia. The paper cuts are something that you would find throughout homes where people would have these devotional objects placed on their walls and you would see it uh, moving from, from home to home. Here it provides the field for each one of these paintings. You also see that the, the framing of these um, it means a lot as well. For me, it was important to have the lions of Ju Judah, the, the, uh, the Hebrew that you see in the top of the paintings actually points directly to uh, Rodney King's uh, 90s declaration, Can't We All Get Along, just sort of brought back to the Hebraic. Tongue-in-cheek uh, play, certainly, but I think in a, in a very real way, dealing with the anxiety surrounding how any artist can ever step into Israel and have a chance of talking about anything other than conflict. What gives you the right to talk about this space? How dare you go into a place there where their history is not your own and their people are not yours? 
there is in that fear an opportunity for an artist like me, someone who seeks that type of danger, that sense of destabilization. There is in that, I think, a place of rich opportunity to say, fuck it, I don't know what I'm doing. I probably will screw up uh, along the way, but hopefully in the act of pushing up against something, I'll arrive at something uh, unique, uh, something graceful. There is, I think, in all of this work, a kind of elephant in the living room, and it has to do with the fact that a lot of these are um, attractive men who are being uh, approached by another man in the streets. There's this a sense in which you're saying that they're beautiful enough to be in these grand narrative paintings. There's a type of charged homoeroticism that's presupposed in that narrative. So what happens? I mean, generally what happens is all of the guys then come back to the studio. We're going through art history books. And as opposed to it's being uncomfortable, what tends to usually happen is that it becomes competitive. People tend to want to see who will be able to perform the best sense or the best version of themselves in these paintings. What you're looking at is, sure, who they want to be for themselves, but you're also looking at them trying on some, some ways to, to please me, I would imagine. So is this what you want? Is, am, I, am I assuming this pose the correct way? How do you look at these paintings? What lens do you access each time that you go through it? The religious is an important part when you think about this. All of my earlier work was inspired quite profoundly by the ceiling frescoes of Tiepolo, the Venetian school, that sense in which light drawing itself across the body is both religious, rapturous, and erotic. Light on the body is the ways in which we see the body. The only way that painting functions is the way that light bounces off of, off of structures. Very early art historically, people have codified light along the body and running across the body as a sense of grace. The depictions of Christ uh, have always been associated with a type of rapturous light that bathes itself across the body. What is the responsibility for an artist in terms of his depiction of others? There's a type of empathy that you have to assume or, or deny when it comes to the depiction of the light on flesh. As you notice in so much of my own work, I really turn up the volume on that light. I really want to be able to look at whiteness as the presence of light. I was inspired by Richard Dyer, who uh, uh, began in uh, radical queer studies, later in film studies. He wrote one of the first books on whiteness. Coming out of that school of Native American studies, African American studies, the question is why are there no whiteness studies, the first things. Uh, he worked towards that and started looking at the nature of whiteness as it relates to early metaphors senses of, of meaning and painting. It's really, it's really uh, hardcore stuff. And I think it, it, it applies to every artist and painter or photographer, anyone who deals with light. The project that you're seeing here is based on a tour of French uh, Northern and West Africa. I went all over from Gabon to Morocco, Tunisia, Congo, Cameroon, and I looked at some of the masterpieces of the Louvre, using the Louvre as the starting point, because the Louvre is basically the seat of power there. Here in Tunisia, you'll see uh, twins being uh, uh, placed in the same poses as some of the grand uh, paintings that you'll see in the Louvre. But also using some of the, the, the tools that I've managed to fashion over the years, this obsession with the background is this, this field that, that comes forward. But also becoming uh, very uh, uh, for, forthright about sexuality, about the body in that space. Africa features as an important part of this picture because insofar as this project is about, uh, yeah, that's a choice. This is uh, Ang's uh, uh, portrait of a man seated. Ang being one of the 
premier uh, painters in the Louvre and one of my early heroes, I had to come back to him. Why Africa, though? Why Brazil? Why uh, Israel? The sense in which all of these countries say something about America is why I wanted to go there. This is the portrait of America. This is about America's anxieties, all of the things that we worry about in terms of our own foreign policy, in terms of the way that we see ourselves as a nation. My work is, sure, a look outside at other cultures, but it's also a look inside. What I learned very early on as an artist exhibiting all over the place was that from north to south, black American culture has been beamed into every living room across this world. And on the leading edge of that culture is hip hop. Everywhere you go, you'll find young people trying to fashion their own stories and using it through a very American idiom. So when I'm creating these bodies of work, what I'm doing is I'm going out into the world and I'm collecting a sense of echo, a sense of who we are out there in the world. And sure, it says something very dearly about us, but it also says a lot about who is out there in the world and how they fashion themselves. It's this type of twin portrait that's existing there. Kehinde means second born of twins. I'm a, I'm a twin, and the next time you meet a Kehinde, say, where's your twin? And I'm sure someone will be impressed. Uh, but twinning and that sense of finding the other side to the thing is something that I tried to put in there very early on. This Jamaica trip here was, uh, quite telling because what I wanted to do in Jamaica was to get outside of the normal everyday street casting and, and, and major boulevards. What I ended up doing was uh, going into the nightclubs there. Nightclubs there actually exist in the streets and so a lot of those people dancing there were coming out of that tradition. Looking at John Singer Sargent, looking at Angra, looking at Velasquez, looking at some of those great precedential paintings uh, that uh, really set an example to me for excellence uh, were what gave rise to uh, this body of work and specifically the work that comes out of Jamaica. Jamaica has, on some level, this weird tension between the formal and the vulgar. You can't help but to recognize overt sexuality as it's performed. At the same time, you have to recognize that different social norms about what is acceptable in a painting and what that says about the person being pictured, what that presupposes about the man who's painting these people. All of that comes into picture and all of that comes into place specifically when dealing with female bodies in public space. The pictures of women are historically have always been designed for the male gaze. Women have been placed in amazing, beautiful pictures, but generally with their heads turned away so that men, by and large, can feel comfortable drawing their eyes across their bodies. With the exception of very few, Cassatt, Artemisia Gentileschi, and so on, uh, we have a huge corpus of what it feels and looks like to be a woman in picture making. I wanted to change that a little bit, but also embrace the very real uh, history. What I did was I started to fetishize some of those places where women's spaces were considered acceptable. I fetishized fashion. I sat down with Ricardo Tichy of Givenchy, uh, uh, and we went through the Louvre. We actually walked through the Louvre and looked at specific paintings and said, let's turn up the volume on some of these. Let's design something. So he designed this collection of unique, one-of-a-kind, uh, couture gowns and so my job then was to to go out into the streets of Harlem and Queens and Staten Island and Brooklyn and find beautiful black women and allow them to play in this game completely different game uh, dealing with the type of um, pitch that I had in mind on the streets of uh, New York with women was a completely different game. I think women, by and large, are just tired of boy shit. It, it just tired. <laughs> and it was. It,
<laughs> there was just like there was this wall. There was like, okay, hey, hi, can I can I get in somehow? And the answer was in, increasingly no. But at the same time, I think once people saw examples of the work and really got it, and, uh, it changed. And there was there was a sense in which they were like, okay, he's about something. This is this is okay. All right, I get it. <laughs> the work here um, is beautiful, with a capital B, shamelessly so. I think that so much of contemporary art has a certain fear or shame surrounding something that's beautiful. There's so much snark that surrounds contemporary art culture. There's so much irony that surrounds contemporary art culture. And I, I thought it would be interesting as an experiment to go back to sheer beauty, celebrating aspects of the self that we consider to be vulnerable, uh, aspects of the self that we don't necessarily want to see, but heightened. The uh, pop culture version of this would be looking at the red carpet. You know, everyone wants to be in the ball gown, but you have to sort of have sneakers or something to fuck it up, just to, to make it feel acceptable. In my own work, what I decided to do was to look at beauty itself and stand back from it certainly, to understand its contours, its, its power vernacularly, but also to be able to, to embrace it as, as a field, as a force. Politically, uh, the figurative is something that black people have embraced for generations. Back in the 19th century, it's, back in the 1960s, uh, the black arts movement demanded figuration because Abstraction was considered a luxury, a wasteful luxury of your aesthetic ability to communicate something. Your, uh, your position as a young artist communicating what black people need in America today should not be overrun by these wasteful notions of the beautiful or the, or the purely aesthetic. Fast forward all of these years, and there still is, I think, an echo of assumptions to be to be made surrounding the work of, of African and African American artists. There's this annoying presupposition that you have to come from this sort of politically corrective point of view. Oftentimes, what I try to do in my work is to turn up the volume on those things that are very selfish and decadent and beautiful and toxic and say to hell with it. All of that can exist peacefully or in conflict with a political narrative. I will have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> there ultimately though will never be a 100% satisfied audience and I don't think that's what you should be planning on as an artist. Listen, I didn't plan for any of this stuff. I didn't, I didn't think I was gonna be able to pay back my student loans coming out of Yale. <laughs> um, there, there has to be There has to be space for that same level of pluck and defiance that got you here to remain there. It's the DNA of, of what we do. You know, I studied cooking so that I could maintain this art habit. And what I decided years ago was to do away with all the stuff that my professors wanted me to paint and it was only after I started creating work that I thought was just garish and uh, uh, horribly self-indulgent and terribly confused and uh, embarrassingly queer and uh, like all of that stuff is what the world responded to on some level and it, it came as a huge shock. And years later, here we all are. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> there, there, there is no system, there's no plan. There's this path that you've been following. My mother on welfare with six kids, beautifully educated, but you know, it was what it was, sent me to Russia when I was 12 on this free government program. I ran into Russian icon paintings on gold and, and fell in love with that type of portraiture. Years later, I'm still in love with that way that gold can shine through skin. That way that in a really small little painting, you can get the same level of punch 
that you can from the sort of massive 25 footers that I've been up to. Uh, painting is very old school and played out, and it's you know it's it's colored paste and a hairy stick. You're coaxing something <laughs> into into being, but I think there's something really romantic about it, and I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm I'm a romantic, sure. I'm, I'm embarrassed by romanticism, so I guess in that sense I'm sort of a modern romantic, but I'm a romantic. I love this idea of being discovered. I love this idea of chance. That's why all of my models are chance-driven opportunities in the streets. Here in Haiti, I got tired of this disaster narrative. I decided to create a beauty pageant. So I got on the radio. Uh, and I called people all over the country, open call, so there's like the classic pageant girls, and then there's like farmer girls, and there's like all of it all together. And there's, there's no judge, right? So it's all chance. You pull out the numbers, and you know, people are mad, you know? <laughs> but in the end, what you get is this wonderful sense of all of this effort, an entire lifetime of learning how to paint, using an arsenal, the language of painting for centuries of people whose shoulders I stand on, using that to the effort of talking about these particular people at this one moment in time. What does that do? What does that mean? What is this exchange value? I have no idea, but I like it. I enjoy it. I think it's a worthwhile exercise, both conceptually and uh, personally. Um, Haiti, however, is one of those sites where there's a narrative that pre-exists, or I mean, people assume they know what's going on with Haiti before they even look at the picture. For me, I was tragically um, uh, disabused of some of my uh, uh, assumptions about Haiti. It's a beautiful country. Outside of the capital city, which is just a basket case, there's this amazing series of small and medium-sized towns where people are figuring it out, falling in love, fashioning their lives in ways that are graceful to them, in ways that make sense to them. All of the poses in Haiti, world stage Haiti, come from both uh, Portuguese, uh, Spanish, and then French paintings, paying homage to its colonial past. It's important for me always to, when going to, oh, this is when we were announcing. <laughs> it's, um, that's funny. So, <laughs> each time that we did the, <laughs> that was cute. Um, so, you know, there were, there were big cash prizes and all of this for each one. Um, I, the trouble is, when you're casting that wider net, you never know who ultimately is going to be in the paintings because, well, let me think, okay, so there were 12 paintings in the end and we got 18 people. So we just had, ended up having to do 18 contestants and 18 prizes. It's really fun. It's a really bizarre way of, of dealing with portraiture. Is it about portraiture or is it a type of social experiment? Is it a type of performance art? Is it a type of political social act? Yes, I suppose on, on all of those levels, it, what I'm doing is trying to engage the culture in, in many different ways. The material practice of painting, sculpture, all of it, um, you have to use that as a means of saying something broader. Stained glass here at the Brooklyn Museum for the very first time comes out of a trip to Africa, strangely. I was in a hotel room in Nigeria, and on CNN was a story on stained glass in Poland. And so I was on the next flight to Poland. <laughs> uh, from then, I discovered that the seat of power for glass was the Czech Republic, where I then went and found this small studio in Novi Bor. And these guys 
service all of the big cathedrals throughout Europe. It's an incredibly old practice where you're taking ground up pigment and that melts into the glass. And you gotta wipe it away. This becomes part of the structure of the glass. So each of these takes Ang's uh, stained glass suite, fusing the best of the models that I've been working in the last 10 years with, giving them a call and saying, come on back, and allowing for this entire uh, suite of stained glass to be erected for the first time ever here at the Brooklyn Museum. It was important for me at the Brooklyn Museum to show a full range of where I started with all of that crazy hair stuff, um, where I uh, saw myself moving into in terms of uh, material practice from video on into drawings and paintings. But it, I think it was also important for the work to show the diversity of, of New York City, of America, and increasingly the culture of the world that was inspired by, um, uh, arguably, uh, right here in New York. Uh, a New Republic is an exhibition of painting, sure, but I think it's in a broad way an observation of the culture that surrounds all of us, an observation of one artist's struggle with how to at once be mindful of what he wants to paint, but also the way that the world has its own urgent way of seeing itself. It's push and a pull. I'm uh, incredibly indebted to all of you for caring about art. It's insane that in the 21st century you can have a room full of people like this who care about art. Thank you all. Thank you. I want to say thank you so much to Kehinde. That was fantastic. We're going to have a short Q&A. If you do have questions, we'll be around for about 10 minutes. Uh, so if you have any burning questions that you'd like to ask Kehinde, please stick around. I definitely want to thank DJ Spooky, Paul Miller, uh, for that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation earlier as well. I work in the adult programs department here at the Brooklyn Museum in the Education Division, and I have to say it's quite an honor to get to work so closely with the curators and also such fantastic artists uh, to create programs like this. So I want to say thank you, our visitors, for coming and supporting our work, and I wish all the best to you. So if you'd like to just come up to the microphones, we're going to take a few questions for 10 minutes, and I'll definitely give you a heads up to let you know we have a couple minutes left. So you guys are shy, all right. Uh, anybody got a question, comment? Want to you know, fight? Let me get, I do. All right. Uh, hi. Yeah, First, let me just say, fantastic. I taught art and I've painted and been a Brooklyn artist for 30, 40 years, and you were wonderful. But uh, the terms of actually technically producing your paintings, which are enormous, how do you do it? Good question. So, uh, a lot of those paintings are just insane. So uh, oftentimes people will ask me, how long does it take to make a painting? Um, there is no answer in terms of one painting because some are big and some are small. But in general, what I do is I paint the portraits. I do all of those people that you see in those paintings. Um, I have studio assistants. I stand on the shoulders of all those artists who came before me. There's a tradition of, of uh, basically working with other artists to create those flowers and all of those. Uh, I'm not painting all those leaves. Um, <laughs> And so um, it's a division of labor, and, and that's the way it works. Um, but ultimately, um, I would say that for the average big one, like those ones that you saw in, in the down exhibition, those took about four months per painting to do. Um, but you know, the average painting isn't that huge, so you sort of figure it out that way. 
Hi, my name is Jesus Jean Baptiste. Um, I'm 18 years old, and I go to Dr. Susan S. McKinney Secondary School of the Arts. Um, I'm a high school student, and I wanted to ask you, um, how do I get myself to your area of, of how do I get myself to your level? How, what do I have to do to accomplish what you've accomplished? Like, what is it? Who, <laughs> who's influenced you to do what you've done? Like, what influences have shaped you to get where you are? Yeah. Going? No, I mean, listen, I mean, Paul, as a, as a successful DJ and musician, as, as, as an artist, I had no idea. I, you know, I was talking about my student loans. There's just no sense in which you ever know that you're going to make it. I think that what I ended with that, that comment was about uh, staying true to my, my own sensibilities, my own convictions, and just knowing that there is a compass inside of me where I know that I'm creating something that makes my own hair stand on end. And I don't have an audience in mind. I can't close my eyes and imagine any of you. It's all about me. And <laughs> what I'm doing there is I'm having faith in the fact that if it turns me on, the chances are that it's gonna turn someone else on out there. And that's the only thing you do. I mean, it, it's basically self-pleasuring. It's, it's a masturbatory act. Well, you know, I, as a DJ, I was never planning on DJing either. I mean, I, I, we met when you were at Yale, if I remember correctly. I might be crossing some wires. But I did some studio crits with Peter Halley, and there was a whole scene of people who had been buzzing about some of your early work. And I used to show with Jeffrey Deitch and switch over to Paula Cooper Gallery. But um, when you think about painting versus music, that's also a question I get a lot, is like, how do you become a successful DJ? Or DJ culture is huge at the moment, and it's getting bigger every day. But the eerie thing for me as an interdisciplinary artist is, was finding that um, there was a tension between how museums thought about the fine arts versus popular culture. And I think there's always been a resonance. When, when Ken, they first moved to New York or when I was doing stuff, there was this eerie sensibility of how the galleries and museums are slightly divorced from everyday life. And that we've seen that radically change in the last several years. But um, I'd say your average artist, there is no roadmap and half the battle is I, I think what which he's also Ken has been quite brilliant at is branding and tactical sensibilities of how painting and sculpture can be reconfigured into a modern moment. Um, so if you're in high school, this is your time. I mean, you, our brains are all frozen because you know, um, <laughs> you, know you guys have there's a term called neuroplasticity. Look it up. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but this 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 is uh, the, the era where it's all about learning how to learn. That's what, that's what I think is really important. Who next or me? Uh, you, you can go ahead. Oh, great. Um, first of all, I just want to say how lucky we all are that you are not only a great painter, but you're an amazing performer in describing your painting. So thank you for that. Um, my question is, um, you're very open about your sexuality, and it seems like the men in the pictures that you paint are almost making love to you as you're painting them. And I wondered... Um, <laughs> 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 anyway, I wondered how you feel, um, how you feel painting women, and if you could talk about that a lot, it'd be great. Thanks. That's a hot mess, and <laughs> I don't know how my partner would feel about that. I I have, for a very long time, enjoyed the sense in which sexuality plays a role in almost everything that we do in terms of figurative painting, but I draw a very strong red line when it comes to my own personal life and my, my work. I mean, that's just, that's just not, nah. <laughs> um, but I, I, do, I do, in some sense, see what you're talking about, though. There, there has to be um, space for us to imagine the erotic in, in art. There has to be a space for us to imagine the sense in which uh, both a heteronormative or, or a, a homo erotic sensibility uh, has to be in there. With the, with the paintings of the women, uh, I don't know what's going on with that. I, 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 I proceed with my work in a very professional manner. I, I talk to the women about 
why I think these paintings are important, what I think is going on in these paintings. Um, I don't think my sexuality is the issue, whether it be male or female paintings, because I ain't fucking nobody in this, in the, in the, in the, in the <laughs> sorry. So, I appreciate the question, <laughs> but no. Well, let, you know, I just want to riff on that for a second because, you know, the funny thing is, I, I guess I would be the heteronormative voice here, you know, I, I like women, you know, but it, it's always a pleasure to see how these, these conversations unfold. I mean, if you look at in art photography like Robert Maplethorpe with uh, his representation of African American males' penises, or you know what's been going on with Andy Warhol, where he had this sort of uh, sort of harem of, of young men and his, that would end up in his paintings or would help make the paintings. I mean, Kennedy's triangulating. I mean, from several traditions, but not all of it has to do with sexuality. But I, I think it's much more about the politics of perception. Um, uh, so I'm Irving from Brooklyn, and it's a pleasure to be in this room with you guys. But my question was, how does it feel, you are an, a living artist, uh, extremely successful at this point in your life. Uh, I mean, a lot of artists before us weren't able to see their artwork in museums or galleries, et cetera, et cetera. How do you take it? I mean, we live in a social media age where um, everything is so easily accessible nowadays. So do you have like a sense of where you, you kind of have to protect yourself or you can, you're kind of a celebrity artist now. I mean, thanks to Empire and uh, Dan. <laughs> 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 Not that I wanted to take it there, but just the, um, yeah. to wrap it up, the question, how does it feel to, uh, from artists before to now, you, you're just, you, you're quintessential, you've made it so much and it's kind of like amazing to be in this room with you, but there you go, the question. <laughs> so, okay, so, can you guys hear me? Because yeah. there's a back and forth thing, it's kind of weird. Um, I, I don't really think about it that much because I, I guess I'm naive. I think that being a painter is a different type of, I'm sure, I'm a noted painter, fine. Okay, so like occasionally. Or the fear, the fear, because the anxiety of being an artist and ha of having to overcome that fear as to you overcame well, let me, it. Let me answer your first and I'll get to your third, I think. I, I get it. I, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I, and, it, and it does bother me on some level, but at the same time, I just, like all my friends are artists in New York City. New York City is one of those cities where people are not that impressed, right? So, <laughs> like, Brad Pitt will be walking down the street and people are like, yeah, I'm cooler than him. You're like, that's just the way New York City is. Um, and so I, just, I don't oftentimes feel that until I'm in those places where it's about my work and it becomes a professional sort of thing. And, it, and that's, you know, you put on that hat and you do it and then you go home. And, you know, my partner at home is not making me feel that. You know, it's, it's very like, all right, did you feed the dogs? You know, it's, 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 it's back, to, back to that. There, do, there does on some level have to be a type of uh, reality check when it comes to the way that your work is perceived and consumed. Um, every artist on some level has a responsibility of knowing how they sit within a culture that dialogue between the reader and the writer, the, the viewer and the painter, is one that's really important, one that's really precious, and it, it affects the way that you, you think about your work, the way that you think about yourself. I don't think I'm naive enough to say that artists should go back to that romantic space, that cave space where we're assumed to be working on our magnum opus, our confession, and we emerge from this, this quiet space. We, we live in the 21st century where you know, sure, I'm gonna do really fun things with my friends who might happen to be in TV doing some show called Empire, right? So Lee Daniel calls me up and says, this thing is going to be either the biggest hit ever or it's gonna like crash like the worst thing you've ever seen. And I was like, I love it, let's do it. It's like, whatever, you're my boy, let's go, let's go. And I know that within my own work, there is a capacity for people to recognize both pop culturally what's going on there, there's a resonance for people to see it, I know that there's the ivory tower sensibility in which people recognize some of the conceptual and art theoretical sensibilities within the work. I know that the work exists on several levels and so I don't have to feel as though it has to fail or succeed on any one platform. 
I think that the strength of being an artist in the 21st century now is that we have all of these cross-platform synergies, the ability to work here in the United States, uh, have studios in West Africa, Beijing, have galleries all over the place, and have viewership and people who appreciate the work on different levels for different reasons, and, 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 and for me to be able to say, you know what, this is what I feel like doing today, let me satisfy that itch, the other day, let me scratch that. Uh, uh, first off, thank you so much for coming out and spending time with us. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could speak to your relationship, if you have uh, one, with those who collect your work. Because I'll, I'll go to fancy dinner parties and I'll see your work in somebody's home, and half the time, you know, they'll be really proud of it. They'll understand the context. They'll be, the, you know, they'll they'll get it. And then other times, they'll talk about everything but the meaning of the work. They'll say, "Oh, yeah, he's really hot right now," and "Oh, this is going to be worth so much." Oh, did you know he's coming to the it's going to be at the Brooklyn Museum, and oh man, the value of my collection is going to blow up, and I want to hit those people. <laughs> and, and I was just wondering if you, if you what, what kind of dialogue, dialogue and relationship you have with the, those who collect your work. The individuals, not institutions. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious about your social life. Is that <laughs> <laughs> wow. Every person's house has a Wiley. That's great. Um, <laughs> but I, I do find that going to collectors' homes, there's oftentimes this sense in which it's like uh, the only other black person in the room is on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is, let's face it, a reality to the art world and the art money and the art industrial complex that provides oxygen for all of this incredibly expensive and wasteful stuff that I do that gives rise to voices for all of these people that populate my paintings. There's a wastefulness to the entire enterprise. It's decadent. These are, again, high-priced luxury goods for wealthy consumers. These are very strong lines in terms of production value. How much will it cost for me and a team and a sound boom guy and a camera guy and insurance and shipping? And just think of the entire enterprise of it all. And, uh, you know, not every artist works like I do, but there is a very real sense in which there's a justification for why these things are expensive on, the, on, on my end. But that won't stop me from recognizing that there's a certain sadness to that. The majority of the people in my paintings, I would argue, I don't know all of their uh, business, but I would argue that most of them cannot afford these paintings. And so what does that mean, that you're creating these works that then go out to say all of these wonderful things about a culture and, and possibilities, but at the same time there's, well, what it means is life is not fair. And I've been dealing with that reality from the very day that I stepped into this earth. This work is about some of the crucial unfairnesses that surround all of us. Will the work change the world? Will the work have any sort of mechanical change in terms of like social uh, disparity? I doubt it. But I do think that in some strange way, what I do has this blast zone, this weird echo that inspires young people and gets people moving. I, I can't put the entire weight of the, the world on my shoulders, but what I can do is try to do my best in my field and try to change what I feel is worth changing. But in the end, it's, it's, it's really strange that for an artist who makes paintings at my price point, this question rarely comes up for the white boys who sell things at teens of times. And it's just a strange recurring of, of themes. And it's, you know what it is? I'm not going to play a, a weird sort of feel bad for me because I'm the, the black American artist who's being asked this question. I do want us all to do a thought experiment and imagine what that feels like if we ask a, a Jeff Koons what his price points are and why they're that way and what that says about the collectors that choose to collect his work. Sure, there's a rift between social justice and the realities of the art industrial complex, but don't lay those on my shoulders. Oh, no. You know, in, in that same context, I wanted to ask you a question about the intersection between photography and theater. And 
And amusingly enough, a lot of the work comes out of these photo shoots. So it's almost like if you ever do a magazine, you'll set up a whole situation. And you know, if you think about photographers who've been doing this for a long time, uh, then st making a still life out of that. You know, so there's a kind of tension between photography and the painting. So I'd love to hear how um, you balance those two issues. Because some people have said, is it painting at all? And you're working with a whole team. Is it, you know, where is the brush stroke? That kind of thing. And you know, just talk about some of the process of transferring from a photograph oh, to no, a painting. That, that, that's a great question. I think um, we'll get to the other questions. But I think it's a, a good one that you ask because for artists who are working in the 21st century and have these tools, uh, digital tools that allow you to heighten and diminish color, to place things there that perhaps weren't there, um, it adds a certain lev level of mystery. Art in the age of mechanical reproduction presupposes that there is a suspicion surrounding everything that you look at. In fact, every country that you look at in uh, my bodies of work uh, will have someone in there that throws it off. So for Nigeria, the entire body of work is mostly Nigerians, but there's one guy from Queens. <laughs> and you'll never know which guy, right? And so uh, what I want for the viewer to do is to know that there is a sense of, uh, of chance there. There's a sense in, in which the whole thing is, is a production. Photography itself is, is a production, a, a reduction of, of the, the, the actual world, flattened out for us all to, uh, to see and to consume in, our, in the way that we will. Uh, art, painting, cannot proceed without photography in this day and age. I'm not a photorealist, and so I don't, I'm not, I don't have an abiding interest with the, the photograph, nor am I a paint fetishist who wants to create these sort of thick, buttery surfaces. I think I'm somewhere shot down the middle. The passing posing series that I began my career with came out of uh, a really interesting conversation that Susan Sontag had at Yale years ago talking about the work of Roland Barthes in this notion of passing through the screen or posing for the still, whether it be moving pictures or stills, digital or analog, one has to either pass or pose through those spaces. My thinking around it was in a much more African-American sense of posing or passing. Passing in terms of the paper, paper bag test, posing in terms of masculinity, authenticity, who are you really, these sites of authenticity, what is real, what is authentic, what can we have 100% confidence Nothing. That's the point. Um, real quick, I know you're pressed for time. Uh, so my question is, well, first of all, I only caught the last 10 minutes. I thought it was phenomenal. But I thought it was phenomenal. With that, what do you feel, this message that you put you know, African Americans in, and the culture that's happening right now in America, do you feel that this in some way, shape, or form will ultimately cause a lot of self-confidence to, to be instilled in us and to see ourselves in this light? And if so, uh, how long do you think that will ultimately get inside of our minds? <laughs> you guys are laughing, I didn't hear the last part. What, what was the last um, part? If so, how, how much longer do you feel it would take to ultimately you know, seep into our minds to see ourselves oh, in this light? Um, I don't know, I think, I think self-esteem is a wonderful byproduct, um, but it's not the organizing principle. I think I've got way too much in terms of conflicting uh, starting points, conflicting motivations to even have time to think about your self-esteem. Sadly, it's, it's, it's all about me. And <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. And, and, and what you end up with is a room full of paintings that talk about the culture, that talk about other people. There's not a single portrait of myself in that room. This is Kehinde Wiley's America. And you guys do with it what you will, but in the end, I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about how I can scratch all of these myriad itches and get something that's interesting, that just turns me on, both aesthetically and historically and conceptually. And, and once all those things are moving, then we got something. And then all of a sudden, there's all of these interest groups, all of these people who've got their own reasons for liking and responding or hating the work. And, and in the end, fine, but I do what I do. And I, 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 I hope on some level that the work is not doing any harm. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily design it to do 
good. Um, but I can't tell you how much I enjoy seeing people happy when they see the work and enjoy the work. You know, that's some real stuff. But um, I'm not going to go back to the studio and be like, oh, you know, people really like that. Let's make, let's crank out a bunch more of that. You know, that's just not the way it works for me. And in, in, in fact, what I do is I, I start judging myself based on my own track record. So I'm competing against myself. And I have to lock all you guys out, sadly. And I have to sort of keep my own sort of Keep, keep in shape by, by boxing myself that way. So I'm, I'm on to the next thing. I'm, 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 I'm moving in, in different territories. I'm working with different ideas and perhaps what you'll see here in the museum. But I think what you'll see is there's a, a link, there's a chain of custody with regards to the ideas that occupy the, occupy the painting. I, I, w I wanted to ask about, uh, building on the other guy's question about how your work interacts with the art market and to me, the difference between your work and Akun's is that your work explicitly explores this sort of the class structure that we live in, or at least it seems that way. And so I think that the question there, it's, it strikes me as a, an irony that uh, your work, that's a, it's a commentary, it's a, it's a visceral commentary on the world, would end up in the hands of uh, mostly white wealthy collectors. I mean, how do you see that interaction? It seems like a, a core part of the work at large. Asked and answered, but I'll, I'll do it again. Um, <laughs> Kuhn's work is decidedly about class. Kuhn, Kuhn's work is decidedly about race. Sadly, no one's talking about it that way. Uh, if you look at what Kuhn's does, is he celebrates this type of childlike mania surrounding a dizzying notion of wealth, what it looks like, what it feels like, these sort of shiny adult toys that are charged with this fetishized sense of money. Um, that's Coons. And uh, I think that at its best, what it does is it answers that question by refusing to answer the question. Jerry Salt uh, wrote about Coons that the mystery of the work is that it presents itself as empty, not only at the surface, but all the way through down to the floor. <laughs> I think that what my work tries to do is to play just like the white boys are allowed to, to assume that a level of complexity is possible from an African-American artist, to presume that there shouldn't be one place where you have to land in terms of resolving issues surrounding black bodies in public space and fetishized pricey objects. It presumes that there is a level of maturity uh, within the viewership and the collector base. It, it asks a lot, and I'm, I'm not gonna step away from that. that that's, re that's really interesting. You know, I wanna jump in for a second. <clears throat> Because I think that uh, this gentleman's question presupposes this idea of controversy. And um, I love the way that, say for example, when Shep Ferry did the photograph of Obama that eventually became the Obama Hope poster, right. um, there was a certain kind of controversy about ownership and about originality. What do you think that is so selective about the controversy your work has generated in the discourse? Because um, remember the Village Voice article, that was, some people said it was racist, some people said it was homophobic, um, or both. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you celebrate and own that. And in a way, you kind of say, yeah, this is, I am a black gay male, and this is what I am into. Well, I, mean, the, you know. the, I think the, the Voice article was a missed opportunity because it's outraged by the things that are really exciting and interesting about the work. It's, um, it says, how dare you? But it should have actually allowed that to be a point of saying, well, he's doing this thing. Let's look at that never looks at that. Why not? There's a, there's a lot of missed opportunity. I think that people um, set the bar unnaturally low. And I think that they presuppose a type of pre-existing text on, on the work of others. And they assume that these are just pretty pictures of black and brown people done by this pervy guy. 
<laughs> By the way, that was a headline in the article, right. a pervy, you know, and I was, I, we had a conversation a couple weeks ago. I, I was like, celebrate the controversy, you know, let's burn it or, you know, throw it on, you know, yeah. throw it out into the, the ocean or something. But yeah. the funny thing is, as a heterosexual male, I have always been intrigued with the way the art world deals with the politics of, of identity, you know, and that's something in the 90s, I did, it was called identity politics and so on. You're, that's all come home to roost in the work. I think that the, yeah, it's, it, yeah. seems, it seems like such an old, decayed topic. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry. I mean, no, yeah, no, it's yeah. kind of like, okay. Oh. But, but it, it's kind of funny when an African American reappropriates back, you know, mm -hmm. so if Shep's appropriating or doing something, um, you know, or if, say, for example, when Andy Warhol was doing his appropriations of pop culture figures, but again, his sexuality was highly projected in the work. Sure. Um, you know, I view you as sort of triangulating between what Warhol was doing with branding and then thinking about a tactical kind of engagement with the, the mechanisms that Coons has been able to, to kind of deploy. It doesn't mean that they're endorsed by the work, but it just means these guys have been clever at branding. And I want to see, I want to see this gentleman go into the same arena and just you know, get hip hop on him. He, he's pretty buff, you know. He's kind of you. I, you work out a lot, right? I, you know, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm the skinny guy. You know. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So, listen. I don't. I don't. I don't necessarily put myself in conversations often um, with living artists, really. Mm -hmm. um, because honestly, a lot of the living artists that I love are just like my buddies, you know what I mean? Like I'm hanging out with McLean Thomas and Wangeshi Mutu and uh, Hank, and, and, and in the end it's, it becomes one of these things where you don't really think about it as somewhere else, it, it, it's, it's right here. Um, so there, there is no uh, border crossing. What I do um, want more is a level of scrutiny that goes beyond the chicken grief. Because that Village Voice article mentioned some things that I just don't think were up to the occasion. I can't believe it got past editorial scrutiny just based on these simplified notions of, I, I think it, its opening line has something to do with the fact that this is an affirmative action case. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to me that, I mean, I, I, I honestly read it and I was just like, this, okay, maybe this is like some sort of ironic, uh, playful way of writing. <laughs> <laughs> there, there turned out to be more angry white people came, who came up to me and were just like, you know, what really pissed me off about that article is that it assumed that I was on her side. And they were just like really pissed off that there's this assumption of ye dear reader, and that of course we're all sort of linking together. And you know, these people were just like completely <coughs> put off. I, I, I feel like we're just putting way too much time on this silly article. Well, but, but uh, just, okay, the article aside, but you gotta remember the last time we had a very successful African-American young male painter, Basquiat, um, there was a tremendous amount of controversy about his work. If you ever, if actually he's now very celebrated, but if you go back and do a little bit of archeology, span um, you'll see that he used to get across the board scathing reviews. If try, you know, Google it sometime. But um, the critics were like, who, they literally would call him the pickaninny of the art world. That was, a, that was a phrase that Basquiat was called constantly. Um, and so on. So I'd I mean, it's still with us. Which is, in 2015, you can send these critics down to Ferguson and see what happens, you know, it's really. Yeah. I get it. I'm just not allowing that to populate my space. All right, last question. Hi, my name is Monel. I'm a Haitian artist. And any advice that you would give to a portrait painter and also which one is your favorite prod project? Portrait painting is tough. Um, portrait painting is one of those things that um, is so fixed. And if you'll notice that if you're doing portrait painting for the entirety of your career, it has one thing in common, and that's the body. And you, often, you oftentimes have to return to the body. People will assume that 
uh, there's maybe nothing left in the body to, to talk about anymore. And so it, it becomes an interesting challenge because uh, of the fact that so many people have tread that territory before, but it also becomes um, a really pregnant site because no one's quite had your body. And so you, sh you should always, in, in some ways, start in a very myopic and personal way. Don't be uh, subsumed or confused by all of those great artists who've come before you. Um, follow your own true north. Figure out what that is. Um, figure out what, uh, what makes you laugh and what turns you on art historically. Fall in love with the body. Paint from life, then from photography, then from life. Figure out what means of breaking light and color down into flesh makes sense to you. Portraiture is an incredibly rich territory. Um, be aware, though, that you will be accused of being repetitive because the body is the body. But in the end, it's an ocean out there. And I think uh, it's a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around for Q&A. We're so lucky, <laughs> so, so lucky. Thank you both so much. I hope that you will join us at Target for Saturday, which will be in celebration of Kehinde Riley in New Republic on May 2nd. And then also this upcoming Saturday, April 18th at 2 p.m. right here in the auditorium, we'll be here with an artist roundtable called Art Protest in the Black Body. I think that you, if you like this conversation this evening, then you'll very much enjoy the conversation this Saturday. So I hope to see you again on Saturday, April 18th, 2 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us this, this evening and please continue to support the Brooklyn Museum.